No, really, we can. Bye, bye, bye. Oh, howdy, man, folks. Fantastic. So welcome to the Charlton Comics Movie Panel. Uh, so how many of you have heard about the documentary? Oh, good. Yeah. cool. And yeah, how many have seen anything from it? Yeah, trying to put more content up as we go. Yeah. The day jobs get in the way sometimes, you know. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're not drawing any salary from this, so this is all we have done when we can you know, get to it. So that's kind of the big question we get a lot is when's it going to be done, when are we going to actually see like, some sort of a finished product instead of all these raw footage clips? And the question is, hmm? Uh, and the answer is, I don't know. Um, you know, it's all based on funding. You know, we're, we're beating the path, and, and I think our big priority for 2018, the first quarter, is to get enough money to really dig into finishing it, get into the post production. Yeah, we're really close to finishing up interviews. The problem with this documentary is that when we first started, we had a general idea about Charlton. It was a comic book company, Adobe Connecticut. Their characters were purchased by DC in terms of the Watchmen. There's a bunch of famous comic book guys who got their start there. Like these guys. These, oh. Sort of. Joe Satan. <laughs> Joe Sinnott. <laughs> <laughs> um, but once we really got into it, we didn't uh, anticipate how many comic book legends got their start there, or passed through, or the characters that were created there, or formed into the identities that you would know today. One of the things that happened early on is, um, you know, you, the first place you go is the internet looking for some information, and we found some, and um, Jackie decided to go into her way back machine and go back and start looking at library microfiche, microfilm, and found out that everything on the internet is 100% bull crap. And she's going down this rabbit hole that, like, you know, every time we think, all right, we just need one or two more guys and we can start editing, she goes, no, 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 and now we got to talk to this one, this one, and this one. So now it goes from two to five. Um, and sometimes it happens with these guys. We went to, we went to go talk to Bob Layton, and we interview Bob, and he goes, "Have you met the Joes?" <laughs> and we're like, "Well, well, no, but uh, we know Joe Staten did some work there. He got his start there." And he goes, "Well, Joe Sinnott did too." And we went over to Joe Sinnott's table, and your son Mark asked you, "How many pages did you do for Charlton?" How many pages of Charlton? Well, for Vinny, yeah. Just the romance, I did uh, 2,700. Yeah, so like a few. <laughs> <laughs> so Slacker. Gorgo and mm -hmm. Rip the Source, a couple other things. But uh, the, those romance stories, but you could knock them off, you know. They were mostly <laughs> headshots and kissing scenes. <laughs> <laughs> but even so, 2,700, it's a lot. It's a couple, right? Keep in yeah. mind that, that, Joe, you were doing these after, at night, right? After dinner, after you did your Marvel stuff, correct? Yes, I did. And I was doing uh, Marvel at the time. Fantastic Four and Thor. I'm doing their two books a month. Plus these uh, stories for uh, Charlton. And uh, I tell you, but then again, hey, I was a lot younger, <laughs> certainly a lot more uh, energy now in those days, you know, but it was fun. So that's kind of what we're up against, and we're also trying to say, okay, we want to tell this 90-minute story. You can't have 90 people in it, because then they all get a little, little bit of screen time. So um, we have to try to prioritize and figure out who and where to stick it all together. But that'll come in post-production. That's going to require bringing on more than just Jackie and I. That's yeah. where it's going to get, you know, you need for somebody. And the other concern that we get from the fan base out there is, are you going to cover people like Pete Morisi, Pat Boyette, the guys that have left us already, Dick Giordano? Everyone's going to have a part in the movie, um, even if we got to animate them. <laughs> Uh, but everyone will be included. We're going to tell the whole story. No one's done it before, so we want to make sure we do it right. And if it doesn't make it into the movie, we're going to have heaps and heaps of bonus features. Oh, yeah, so, there will be a lot of stuff. Web content features. and things yeah. like that. So 
um, none of it will be hidden away, not uh, involved, because we want to share the story with everyone. We were inspired by just going to a panel, and, and <laughs> I saw the names on the on the screen that said Bob Lee, Danny O'Neill, and Frank Lidoff, and Jose Garcia Lopez. Like, oh, let's go to that. That'd be awesome. I didn't know it was about trauma comics, so I turned my head to that. And we got in there, and they started talking about trauma comics. And I'm like, oh, God, I don't want to listen to this. I can't hear to hear about Batman and Iron Man and all this kind of stuff. It ended up being so captivating, we moved down to the front. And the next day, when it hit me, it hit me because I was looking through the hero initiative brochure that I got from Denny. And I was thinking, God, I wish I could get more than just this anonymous $50 or $100, whatever I could afford to give. I was like, I wish I could donate a substantial amount of money. And I started washing dishes and I'm replaying the, the panel. And I went, oh, oh my god, it's, it's a movie. And I so finger dialed her. And I said, well, we can ask the guy that ran the convention I knew uh, could get us the contact info for these kind of people. And she said, no, 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 no. I'm coming over to your house. We'll get, we're driving back down. We're paying to get in. We're going to cold pitch them right there. So that's what we did. And uh, they all said, sure. Yeah. But they didn't expect to hear from us again. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, uh, do you want to talk about what it was like when Keith and I came traipsing into your house with all of our gear? Which Joe? You think you're that Joe? Joe and Hillary had the uh, honor of being the first ones to open their front door to us. <laughs> Literally. And uh, at the time, it was just Jackie and I handling the entire production, so we had like 20 road cases. Yeah. It was, you know, we're shooting this, like, this cinematic feature. How do you like Joe's statement on the story? Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, we got to show up with all, you know. Oh, equipment and um, cameras and uh, yeah, I was I was impressed. They seemed like they had like real equipment. So <laughs> seemed, seemed, like, seemed legitimate. Uh, we we uh, set up on the back porch and it was it was a nice spot back there. Uh, and uh, we, we had uh, had a nice talk about Charlton. I, I wore my E-Man shirt, so uh, it was official. Oh. <laughs> Make credit to Hillary for that. Yeah. Was, ah, yes. Thank you. Credit to Hillary. Years, if I recall. Right? So you got a wardrobe credit. In the <laughs> <laughs> so with that, we were off and running. And early on, we, we had no money. We were just doing this out of pocket, um, borrowing equipment and, and things like that. Um, we figured we wanted to release a trailer that summer at um, Terrific Con at Mohegan Sun in Connecticut. Our friend Mitch is the, the showrunner for that. And we wanted to do it there. And, um, which is his show the year before is where we got the idea. So um, we figured we had to put some names in there, some recognizable faces. So we had Joe and Joe and Danny O'Neill and, and, uh, and Neil Adams. We just put this quick trailer together and it became a, a huge hit. So. Oh! Frank was great there. Right. That was great. Yeah. Hey, Joe, what was it like when we came to your house for the interview? What was it like when we interviewed you? What did you think? Now, heard about hearing and it's good in your words. So, yeah, what, what did you think when they came to your house? What did you think of the interview? When they stormed the house. <laughs> <laughs> we had three people. I knew it was you to stay in that long. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't stop talking. You were full of information. It was a lot of fun, though, really. <laughs> brought up a lot of good memories, you know. A few bad ones, but, you know. All in good fun, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm glad you brought that up because one thing we're finding is that a lot of these people, like Neil Adams is a great example. He's like, yeah, I, 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 was, I did like two things with Charles. I, I can talk for maybe five minutes. Half an hour later, we had to stop his interview because we were actually in the thoroughfare at the convention center and they were going to open the doors. And he was like, oh, but I got more. You know? <laughs> so and then stuff starts coming. Once they start thinking about it, they remember a lot mm -hmm. more than they thought. So. And credit to Jackie for pulling it out. Yeah. Joe Simmons' interview was uh, probably, it was four hours. Four hours. Oh, four. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, oh, yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> Jackie was blonde before she got way off a quick. <laughs> <laughs> it's Charlie and Joe, it's killing me. <laughs> we did take them to dinner, so. Not all bad. Yeah, we, we pay people in, in meals and coffee. That's, that's better than a SAG agreement, right? Sure. Uh, it's funny, though, because if I could get in a 
DeLorean and hate me on hitting 88 miles an hour and go back and find 12 or 13 year old me and tell me that I'm going to be friends with all these guys that I'm reading. Um, you know, not just a professional relationship, I, I consider a lot of them friends now. Mm -hmm. It's really awesome. It's really humble. We hope you feel the same. We're friends, right? <laughs> <laughs> We're friends now. Yeah, of course. Oh. <laughs> not, not under duress, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, and part of the Charlton charm that we're finding out is uh, people are willing to even break silences. Um, like John Byrne, mm -hmm. who decided after hearing who we had in our film, these two guys uh, being major parts of it, decided that he should be part of it too. And it opened his doors. And, his house, you know, and people are stunned that we were able to get him. And it's it's only because of Charlton. I don't think he would have even given us the time of day if it was about Marvel or DC or anything else. Mm -hmm. Okay, about John Byrne talking to him. Oh, okay, yeah. really? Yeah. So, do you guys want to talk about some of your favorite memories from Charlton? Do you want to talk about any memories from Charlton? Any favorites? Any favorites? I'd let it answer questions. Okay. Yeah. People who are, are interested in, in anything uh, that they may be. And uh, I think that's the best way to go about it, really. I remember uh, I was giving a little talk to the one of the schools. I, I, I still do. Go to a lot of schools all the way to what you believe it from uh, uh, preschoolers. Four, what, four or five years old, up until seniors in high school. And uh, I always felt it was best to say, all right, but before I start, or when I do start, I'd rather have you guys ask me a question and then we can take it from there because I want to talk about what you guys are thinking and what you want to uh, talk about. So a little kid raised his hand. I said, all right, you, you first. What, uh, what's your first question? And he said to me, how much money do you need? <laughs> and I said to him, not enough. <laughs> well, if you work for Charlton, you never make enough. <laughs> so since Joe said it like answering questions, does anybody have some? Because we're good with free forming here. Yeah. Oh, yes. Did you have to go in a pool for stories from Charlton? Like Stan would have a pile of pages that you pull from. Did they do the same with Charlton? No, because most of the things I did were with Vinnie Coletta. Right. Yeah. And uh, Vinnie would uh, send me a script. And that's how it was. And I would pencil the stories and send them on to Vinnie. And then get black and then. And I wish, <laughs> no, I, I, I like to say, I wish I, I wish I could have eaten him. I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But Jimmy, at least he never missed a deadline. No, that's true. Did yeah. I? Yeah. He actually could ink, though. He wasn't good ink. Oh, of when course. When somebody cracked it. Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. Four or five. Let's see what's up. Yeah. It was a, did you get picked for a particular one too, Joe, or did you get the polio stories to do? Um, I, I kind of just kind of settled into doing the, the horror stuff and, and the science fiction stuff. Yeah. And once Nick Cuddy came on, I, I did a lot of stuff with Joe Gill because Joe was just, you know, right. Was a machine writing. Uh, you know, I, I have no idea how many pages Joe would write in a, a day, but I did a lot with Joe. And then um, when Nick Cuddy was hired as uh, assistant editor, um, I, I really hit it off with Nick, and he liked writing <clears throat> these kind of uh, whims whims uh, uh, whimsical uh, science fiction stories. Right. And uh, we, we just did a lot of those. So as, as when I could get something from Nick, I, I really tried for it. And, right. uh, uh, eventually, that led to E-Man. So yeah. we, we just uh, uh, just kind of hit it off real well and just kept on doing it. Oh, yeah. And Joe kept on writing. Uh, 
Yeah. 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 I don't know if you guys are aware either, but there is a brand new E-Man story out there right mm -hmm. now from um, um, Charles Cuddy and Staten. Yeah. 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 Charlton has had a resurgence. It's back again. It only took him 30 years to dig themselves out of the grave. Um, but it features an all-new E-Man story. And what's fantastic is that the love of Charlton brought a bunch of comic book creators, some of them who were originals to Charlton. They brought them back together, and they started uh, self-publishing the Charlton Arrow. And um, Right around the time we got the idea for this. Yeah, like they had right, right before it. And so they self-published five, five issues? Six. Six, six issues, and they finally got interest from Diamond to be distributed. So the first issue just came out, Charlotte Carroll, number one, volume two, featuring an all-new E-Man story, but it's uh, an anthology book, so you have a bunch of different genres in there. It's a lot of fun. They, it seemed that they sold, sold out, out. Sold across out. the country. Um, what was fun on Facebook was a couple of Charlton Facebook groups, and people were posting what town they were in or what town they'd gone to, and that they didn't have any copies left. And they already done the pre-orders for number two, so this is going to be the same for Dick and Ben. I right? say that's pretty good. Actually, add a footnote to that. I did my previews for my pre-orders for uh, this month, and the cover B for issue three that you did, the alternate cover, sold out. I couldn't get it. Oh, your cover. Oh, so I'm hoping. Fancy. You know, I'm put the up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it seems like the uh, the stores totally. Um, uh, misjudged the, the demand for new Charlton material and uh, just did not order enough uh, books to uh, for, for there to be enough to go around. So uh, I, you know, people people want Charlton stuff. Yeah. And it, that's really awesome that when we started this two and a half years ago to think that a, a new Charlton comic book would be in a second printing. Yeah in the first month of release is pretty darn awesome. Yeah. Will there be a movie adaptation of the... Uh... <laughs> well, actually, our plan from the beginning was to dovetail this all together because uh, Paul Copperberg has become like, one of our really good friends, and uh, Paul really helped us in the very beginning get this thing moving forward and putting us in contact with people. And Paul's spearheading, he's one of the three guys spearheading the, the comic book. So the epilogue to the movie was going to always be and we were hoping, oh my god, I hope they get distribution and don't end up going for self-publishing before we get done with the movie so we can tag in with this, and they made it. So now we will have this happy epilogue to the movie. And it's going to be like the last 10 or 15 minutes. It'll be all about the new Charlton. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. Full circle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, anybody else have questions? Yeah. So what was the practice at Charlton regarding original artwork? Mostly shredding. Uh, it was just stacked and, and left to, to mulch. Uh, but uh, Nick, Nick managed to save a few key things for me, like the, all the original art from the original E-Man. So, uh, so some of the stuff was salvaged, but a lot was just you know shredded, used for other things. Um, so and they just didn't recognize the value. They, it had no value. Yeah, it had no value. Like when I went up to Charlton to start work, they gave me some stuff that said, "Here, you know, this is like, uh, you know, the like stuff we like to see. So take this. And, um, you know, here's this Ditko story. Here's uh, a Jim Aparo uh, uh, story. Uh, here's some uh, Pete Morisi westerns. Uh, just take this stuff, you know." Oh, and uh, some originals, I'm almost certain, are Garcia Lopez romance books from mm -hmm. when he was still <clears throat> in Argentina. Mm -hmm. So wow. that's, that's what they give me. It didn't make any difference to them what it was. Uh, so they, they didn't care or know. Or, um, did, you ever, did you ever get any art back uh, from, from Charlton? No, not a penny. I, I think I had maybe one or two. Uh, I don't know where they came from, but... but in Charlton, they didn't send anything back. Mark might have picked them up by the show, you know, but they were beat up. Two, two romance pages. But someone told me that uh, a fellow out in Canada, Roger Bout, yeah. ring a bell? It does. Oh, yeah. He's a mystery. Yes. Yeah. He, uh, 
Put that in the movie. Uh, that's, yeah, you know that. Yes, I did. I knocked my socks off. You guys didn't tell me that. You're a freak guy. But there were these weird things. I did something for Roger Broughton. And I don't remember the whole deal, but it went through some bank in, in I don't know, it was offshore somewhere. It was in the islands. Bunch and bunch. It wasn't a lot of money, but you know, it, it, some, this this bank that in some country you didn't know. It, it was very weird. Yeah. <laughs> and that's that's yeah, so that's, Charlton. Yeah, that's so Charlton. That's, yeah. Um, but when you talk about getting artwork back, there was a story from Pat Boyette from the 70s when Comic Cons first started up. And Pat was down in Texas. And he was asked to do a con down in Texas. And he, he goes to the show um, and he's planning it out. But he realized when he gets to the show, he's not going to have anything. It's just going to be him at a table sketching, whatever. Um, so he contacted George Wildman, who was the editor at the time. And he said, hey, George, um, I'm going to go to this con, uh, but what am I going to do there? Do you think I could have some, like, Charlton artwork to hand out or something? And so George said, sure. And so George packed up um, a rather large box of original artwork and sent it down to Pat with instructions of, you're not allowed to sell it. You can only give it out. That's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> so, unbeknownst to a lot of the artists, much of their artwork from the 60s and early 70s went into circulation just by George's graciousness. And uh, we're talking everything. So we've got original Dinkos floating out there. Um, some of Giordano's old artwork. Like, a lot, like anything that was just in, in the stock room, because by then... Um, Sal Gentili had organized the art room so that when they went into reprint things, they could just grab and go. So it was easy enough to just grab a little bit of here, a little bit of there, put it in a box, ship it off to Texas, and out it went to the general population. So if you have anything from, like, I'd say the mid-60s, like, or 73-ish, that could be from that show in Texas. There's also a great story we're not going to tell that will probably be in the movie. Um, that's a little hijinks, a little uh, late-night caper to save some artwork. So mm -hmm. we'll leave that one secretive for now. <laughs> Teaser. Teaser, yeah. Teasers. But if you watch the trailers and footage, You'll probably be able to put it together. Put it together. Yeah. Yeah. It's still funny. Speaking of which, since you all are here and we're doing a presentation about a movie, but we don't have a screen behind us to show anything, if you give us your email address, we will provide you with a private link that will last for one week with exclusive content that will probably end up in the movie. Some of it might not. Some of it might not. But it's really good stuff. So we want to make sure that you guys have a chance to see it. You'll have it for a whole week so you can watch it, share it with your friends, and then we'll delete it. Um, so I just want to make mention of that so before you go, we have a clipboard to get your information. It's, it's basically about a minute from uh -huh. every single person we've interviewed Everybody. so far. So I just wanted to try to find something. I tried to find something that might not make the cut, so it's something that you know you won't see again down the road. Just you know, a good story here or there, a nice little anecdote. But um, yeah, so make sure uh, we have a clipboard. So, you know, we'll get your name. Yeah, we have posters too if anybody wants a free week. teaser poster. It's Bye. Bye. Question for the Joes. Um, when they, by working at Charlton, did they have to keep that secret from their other job? Oh! Yeah. When you worked at Charlton, did you have to keep it secret from that? Well, oh, they didn't know them. <laughs> so, yes. None of us Actually, 59, when we, we were building up for about six months, 
And uh, <clears throat> Vinnie Coletta called me right away and he said, Joe, he said, I know there's, there's no work around. He said, but I have an account up at Charlton. And he said, uh, I can get all the work I want. And if you uh, will do my penciling, he said, I, I can get you a lot of work. And of course, I had three children at the time and I needed any work I could get. So that's when uh, I started with Charlton. And uh, so then after six months, when Stan called me back, he said, Joe, we're, we're starting back up again. And uh, so, you know, I did uh, Thor and the Fantastic Four for, for uh, inking. I was inking with Jack Kirby. And, uh, but after supper, I'd go upstairs and I'd pencil a page or two of, uh, of romance because I could do it fairly quickly. And, uh, and then, of course, I also uh, Gorgo, which was, I really enjoyed doing that. And I hear again, I would have liked to have inked it, but really, we didn't get And, uh, you know, if I killed uh, 50 people on the street, he, he, he raised 25 of them. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, but, but he, uh, he, I tell you, he was a number by himself. <laughs> and, uh, I used to call, he, uh, he worked at Gerald uh, Square in New Jersey. And all the editors liked him because he never missed a deadline. He was always early. He slept right in the studio most of the time, and uh, I'd call up because <laughs> his, his checks were very rubbery. <laughs> and I, I, used to, I used to call up to complain, and I'd say, and it's, oh, Vinny's not here. He's down the floor at the, at the dog tracks. <laughs> he liked to gamble at the dog tracks. You know? but the, in spite of everything, we got along pretty well together. And I never met him. Never met him until Marvel had a convention, 1975 or 6. And Vinny was the one in charge of the convention. So my wife and I went down, was at the Commodore, huge ballroom, loaded with dealers and people. And I said to my wife, Betty, I said, you know, I've never seen a Vinny or a picture of him, but I bet you I can pick him out <laughs> in this, this big room with all these people. So I looked around, looked around, and I saw this guy right in the middle of the, of the ballroom, had a white suit on, and a black shirt, open to the navel, <laughs> and a big medallion on his neck like this, big old medallion, white hair, he was a good looking guy, short, and uh, I said to Betty, I said, that's, uh, <laughs> so I walked over and I, I tapped him on the shoulder, I said, Vinny? She said, yeah, yeah, what's up? It was Vinny Coletta, you know. <laughs> but, uh, he, he, like I said, he, he, he was a guy uh, that was all by himself. And, uh, but he had some good points, no question about it. But he did uh, like to make shortcuts with pencilers' work. And, uh, but like uh, Jimmy said, he... He could do a real great job, he, but he, his job, he wanted to get, get it done and make some money. And he did very well, no question about it, no matter how much he was getting paid. And then when he was uh, made, uh, what was he made? Uh, art director over DC. He was art director over there. Yeah, he kept calling me up, wanting me to come over there. Oh, although it's funny, when he was working for Charlton, he called me up one time, he said, Joe, he said, don't do the work too good. He said, because they'll expect it all the time. When <laughs> Vinny <laughs> was, was art director at DC, basically that meant he took all his freelance work and did it uh, in the office at DC. 
He did. I've, I've got it in here. He no. did like an issue no, of Fight an Army yeah. with John D'Agostino. Oh, I did about and I actually found it, but I haven't got the copy yet. But it's on Mark's uh, checklist. And there was another one, another monster. Uh, Jimmy Jefferson did one of the Soros. Yeah. Yeah. You guys remember that? Absolutely. Joe, I, I know a lot about him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he did that cover with yeah. the loving story. Oh, son Mark. He knows more than I do. <laughs> you guys got any questions? Oh, I have one. Yes. The answer. Because, I don't know. Well, Joe will have a... I know um, if you have anything in there about Jack Keller, who did all the hot rod ones, and then he did the uh, some army stories, but Joe has a funny story about Jack Keller. And uh, see if Joe remembers that one. Yeah, actually... Um, did he say that in the movie? Uh, no. Page oh. of Gorgo, did he do? I don't, I don't know. He did about seven or eight books, 20 pages of books. Yeah. I mean, so. Yeah, Gorgo. Yeah. Come on, Joe. Give me that. Hey, Gorgo. Gorgo. No matter. Inked by Vinny. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, he's, got the, he's got the Gorgo. 150, 160. Yes. That's pretty fantastic. Here's one that he probably he, he did some work in the '70s for Charlton. Yeah. He inked a couple covers for um, Art Capello, and they look mostly like Joe and uh, not much Art Capello. Yeah. Right? Well, when you mentioned Jack Keller, I found um, he's, he's already left us. I found a fantastic audio interview, mm -hmm. so I can ask the person who did it permission to use it, uh, but definitely. Jack Keller. Oh, Jack Keller. Yeah, I heard you have a good story about him. Would you like to share? Uh, that's a great story. Uh, <laughs> I never met him. He did the Westerns particularly yeah. for Marvel. And the, uh, it's funny, 1970, I think it was a 75 convention. Where's the market? They had the dais, and there was Stan in the middle, and there was John Romita, John B. Simon, myself. Tom a couple other guys up in the dais. And uh, <coughs> so I saw Stan, because when I first came in, I shook hands with Stan. And I said, Stan, it's so good to see you. And uh, he said, Jack Keller, he said, I hadn't seen him in so long. <laughs> <laughs> I never used to go down to Marvel. Yeah, that's cool. It was only two hours away. 
it was over 20 years I do the work for them, but I, I didn't like to go, go to the sea. And uh, but anyway, he uh, uh, I, he said to me, "How come you don't come back to Marvel and work for us?" And I said, "Well, if you pay a decent wage, <laughs> I thought I thought he was pulling my leg. I thought, I thought he knew who I was. We talked." to each other every day, week as a phone, but I hadn't seen him in 20 years. <laughs> and uh, uh, in those days, you know, the conventions, we had a dinner along with the conventions. That's how, you know, uh, that's how uh, intimate they were back back in those days. And anyway, he, I heard him, I saw him talking to John Lomita, and then he come over to me and he said, Joe, he said, I thought you were Jack Keller. He said, I haven't seen him in years either. And, but she had a very poor memory, actually. And uh, so he, he took all the people, the place was packed, and he told the people that, uh, you know, the, he thought I was Jack Keller, and uh, I was playing along with the gag. Yeah, it wasn't a gag. <laughs> Funny, funny day. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't there then. Any more questions? Yeah, I'm just kind of the I think we've officially waited five more minutes, but I think we can probably push it to nine. Uh, yeah, I don't think they're going to kick us out. Uh, but if there's any more questions. I, I was thinking. So this whole you guys time, got a nice, intelligent <laughs> question. <laughs> yeah. That, you know, we're talking about romance comics a lot on this panel, and I think the, one of the coolest stories I've ever heard. Uh, and very romantic is how Joe got hired. Yeah. Got hired at Johnson. Would you like to tell the story, Joe? <laughs> no. Um, I, um, I, I got hired. At, uh, I've been thrown out at Marvel DC and taking my samples around. Uh, I, so I, I had not gone to Charleston, but for, I had uh, just gotten married like the day before. And um, my wife, my new wife, Hillary and I were headed off for a quick uh, honeymoon because we were broke, we weren't going far. Uh, but Charlton was on the way, Connecticut was on the way to Mystic. And uh, I had my samples, we went in, Hillary went in with me. Uh, George Wildman said this is the only time he's had an artist come in looking for work with his wife. <laughs> <laughs> But they, they hired me, so um, they, they gave me a, 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 a horror story, a jovial horror story. I took it, and uh, when we got back to Brooklyn, I did my story, and they liked it. And I've been working ever since, so oh, that's it, right? So, yeah, so, so uh, I guess, same job, same wife, so... <laughs> <laughs> Charles. <laughs> 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 Any other questions? Yes. Joe Gill was supposedly a real drinker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yet he remained so prolific. It's not like Bill Everett, you know, who yeah. would be working for a while and you know fell off the wagon. How did he manage this? I mean, what did people say about working with him? Well, um, I, I can't speak for working yeah. for him, but. I do know that if, you, if you're if you an avid reader of Charlton, you can see where he kind of went in and out. You might have a story where... Um, dinosaurs first. Yeah, you're, you're doing a Western, all of a sudden the dinosaur shows up without reason. Um, but I, I think it was just the fact that he was such an avid writer, it was kind of muscle memory. Um, <laughs> but do you guys have anything to say about him? Um, well, you know, I, I don't... Uh, uh, Joe, when he was writing, he, uh, Joe Gill, um, he would forget what he had named the characters on the first oh. couple of pages. <laughs> and by the time he got to the end of the story, everybody had different names. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, sometimes, sometimes it was a different story. He, he never actually reread anything he wrote, but he would, he could just by reflex write anything. I mean, they would write. I don't know. Three or four pages, three or four stories a day, mm -hmm. eight-page stories, and um, I, 
I complimented him one time on a horror story of his that I'd gotten. He, he had no memory of it. Uh, you know, like a, a week before, so he, he didn't know. But, I mean, he really could write, and he understood how stories were put together. Uh, when, when we were doing um, the adaptation of Space 1999, the TV show, uh, it was a, a British... British company was doing it. They had a, a big uh, showing, a private showing of, of, uh, in the days before that was, you know, it was, it was harder to do in those days. Um, you know, their first four or five episodes, so that we would, uh, they took us into the city and we were, you know, seeing what was going to be. And everybody was supposed to understand the, the story, so they know it. And these, these uh, TV guys all really thought what they had was brilliant and nobody had ever done this before. And Joe, who didn't know he's Joe, Joe Gill did not know he was supposed to be quiet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> while these while these shows were coming up. Joe would, uh, was looking at the streets. Now you see this one? He's gonna go over there and this is gonna and then there's gonna be these space characters and he was like telling you exactly everything that was gonna happen. You know, like 15 minutes before it happens, because <laughs> it's just how stories are made. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's how yeah, his mind yeah. works. Um, I don't think he made a whole lot of friends in the TV world. <laughs> <laughs> they should have hired him on the spot. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. Well, that's the big studio for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, speaking of Space 999, um, when the contract came up, George Wildman wasn't so sure if it would be a good business move for Charlton, which is kind of funny considering what they put out. But um, <laughs> uh, so he actually sent Nick Cuddy to the city to spec out the job. Uh, Nick Cuddy is—he's an original fanboy. He loves his content, and George George knew that, and so he knew that Nick would have a good eye for the subject matter. Would it would it be worthwhile? Would people want to read this? And so Nick came back and said, "We should definitely get on board with this." Um, so I think that's that's one of the, the smarter business was that Charlie made, but it, I guess that came down from having good editors that actually did care about the company at the time. Then George even rebranded the, the famous bullseye. He, he was taking a woodworking class at night, and that was his project. He decided to make the, the concept of this new logo, and he made a wood <coughs> mock-up of it. And when we interviewed him, um, he showed it. He brought it out and showed it to us. And wow. yeah. it didn't have his wow. name on it. So Jackie had him authenticated on the spot. Oh, and, uh, you know, who could know? Like four weeks later, he passed away. Oh. Uh, yeah. He, it was uh, shocking. He was so full of energy. And his son Carl kept telling us afterward that coming there and talking about Charlton, like, reinvigorated him. And he started going through all his old stuff. Well, what's funny is that when we showed up to do his interview, um, I was dealing with, with Carwell and George's son, and George didn't know why why we were going to talk about Charlton. <laughs> he even, he even yeah. asked, he goes, why why now, all these years later? And um, there was there was a moment when uh, when Keith and, and the guys were downstairs filming some B-roll stuff, and I was upstairs with George waiting for them to return. And um, so I was talking to him, and when he said, why now, and I told him, you don't, you don't know about the resurgence and everything. And so I told him about the Charlton Arrow resurgence project with Charlton Neo, and he, he had no idea. Carl didn't, you know, didn't think to tell him, and he didn't know. And he was so excited that people care about Charlton. They still care. And when I spoke to Carl uh, a few days later, just to follow up and thank him, Probably thing, and he said, you know, my father, like that meant so much to him that people still care, and he started drawing Popeyes again. He just yeah. got, he was back to work at his Actually, drawing board. We all left with a Popeye. Yeah, he made a sort of Popeye. Um, what's really cool though is uh, the the place that Joe, um, excuse me, that George was staying in. He still had his gigantic artist drawing table oh. in his room. Yeah. Yeah. He, I mean, he had a, he had a modest bedroom, but that drawing board with all of the pencils, all of the inks, everything you would need was still there and still being used. Yeah. Which is so fantastic to see. He was, so he was yeah. a great guy. Apparently, he was quite a rock star in his community there. Quite. Oh. Yeah, like you walked into the um, main lobby area and they had a, a curio full of his Popeye stuff and yeah. toys and all this. And it said, you know, your neighbor, George Wildman, drew Popeye, and like that, you know, he was a rock star. That's all the ladies are like, oh, George. Yes. 
he also drew Clifford the Big Red Dog. He did. Oh, yeah, he was a brilliant, brilliant guy. And his interview was a lot of fun. There's a, I think the, the clip I pulled for the exclusive content is that funny story about San Francisco. Yeah. That's a really funny That's story. That's a good story, so. But you'll get to see that online. <laughs> you can't share that now. Um, yes. Have you gone to where, where, what is where Charlton used to be in Derby? Is it's, it, is there still a building there or is it a raised, parking lot? There's one existing wall left. And there are bread and a planet fitness. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, it's a strip oh, yeah. mall? Like it's, place. It's, a, yeah. it's, a it's a strip, strip mall. It's a strip mall. That's gross. Um, we'll do some yeah. drone flyovers. Of, you know, <laughs> we're trying to find, we have one shot of, an aerial shot of the building. It, this was a soup to nuts operation. I don't know if you guys were aware of this. But yeah, 200,000 square feet. It was, it was, yeah. yeah, it took like, what did George say, like 10 minutes to get from one end to the other. And he used to ride a bike <laughs> to get on quicker. He had this little, like, tri adult tricycle. And, um, <laughs> But they did everything from concept on napkin to putting in their own trucks and distributing it right out the back door. Did, you don't see that. Did anything of Charlton as a business survive the comics, you know, with the crossword puzzle books and all, and all of that? Is that all done? Uh, yeah, all of it was sold off. Um, the comics part of it went under in 1986. Yeah. And they, uh, they sold off everything around then. The last property they sold was Hit Parader. Yeah. And that lasted under its new owner until 2008. But they they held onto their most lucrative things until the very end, until they you know had to shut the doors. But they officially uh, sold off everything in 1991, and they shut down. They shut the doors in 1992. It was a horrible shame. Um, about two years ago, Paul Coverberg called me and said that there was an estate sale at one of the San Angelo properties right in the area. John San Angelo is one of the co-founders and. He bought all this property on two or three streets around the internet. He would bring Italian immigrants to live there and then work in the, in the shop. So I met him down there. In fact, actually, John Byrne showed up at it too. And we were going through the house, but the big item for sale was there was a big brass sign, Charlton Comics or Charlton Publishing. Which you can actually see. Um, and you someone beat us there and bought it. All right. So, yeah. yeah, someone beat us there and bought it, and we went through every nook and cranny of the house in the garage, even where it said, don't go in here. Yeah. Uh, and we were like peeling up the tape, and <laughs> our, our Mitch from Terrific Con was like, he posted the guard, he's like, if I say Red Sox, <laughs> someone's coming. And uh, I'd be peeling the tape where it says, don't go in this door, and he's like, well, the Red Sox played green back <laughs> Uh, all we found were some old shipping boxes. I have two of them. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, there was really nothing. It's a shame. But we wanted that yeah. sign. I have a stupid question. How many? The presses must have been running 24 7. Yeah, that's Funny exactly story. what it was. Funny you say that. Yeah, so they, um, the operation ran like a, a 9 to 5 And they realized that it was inefficient to shut the machines down for the overnight right. shift. It was actually costing them more money right. to do that. That's when the comics were born. They needed a reason to run them overnight, and essentially the comics part of the company was a throwaway. There was no quality control, so they really didn't care. But they just needed something to run. Uh, it was a by proxy, uh, and it's funny because when Dick Giordano became the editor, he, he was one of the first editors who cared, you know, cared yeah. about the comics, and so he would actually run himself ragged working. At the factory during the day, nine to five, he'd go home, have dinner with the family, show up at the factory in the after hours to make sure that everything was printing correctly and coming off the presses. And then he would, you know, stagger home at three a.m., fall asleep, wake up, and do it all over again. Right, but you know, the, which explains why they had thirty or forty of these, you know, Mount Rushmore talents in the building and didn't really care. And but, but the positive that came out of it though is they had so much creative freedom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's why I like guys like Steve Ditko preferred working in Charlton. Or Joe stay in so that he could go on to bigger things. Yeah, they, they you know, they, they had no, like they said, no quality control, so you could try anything out. And uh, I have some stories where the style changes completely in the middle of the story. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, not because you were drunk. No, <laughs> <laughs> Well, when you get to try anything, some of it comes out looking pretty good.
Yeah. So, you know, it's uh, it's this story has so many branches, you know, coming out of it. It's, it's so much bigger than anybody, anybody realizes. I mean, we're getting into the very origin story that the co-founder was dubbed the godfather of bootlegging for copyright infringement back in the 20s with song lyrics. Yeah, I don't know if anybody's aware, but the company actually was founded in prison. These two guys were in jail. <laughs> and they both had a son named Charles, and they had this oh, crazy Charles. scheme to yep. name their company Charles and go into publishing. So we're covering everything. It's, it's, That's how it started. It's unbelievable. And it's a snowball rolling down the street. It should be a movie. Oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> so on our first trailer, we have Bob Lee, and he goes, you know, it's something out of a sitcom, which I suppose is why you're making this. Stuff. It's, <laughs> there, there isn't a common thread in this entire story. Everything is outrageous, unbelievable. You can call me a liar, except now I've got the facts to back it up. It's, it's bonkers, and we love it. It's, yeah, it's, it's too bad Tom Sutton is gone because he really was able to cut loose. Oh, oh no. Jim Carrow, there's so many guys that yeah. were just a little, were a little over a decade too late. Yeah. Um, but it's better late than ever, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, we do have some audio recordings of Dick Giordano. You know, things like that. That's the best part. A lot of people did do interviews with them, what, uh, either written or audio recorded. So we will do our best to utilize them so that these people are correctly portrayed in what they want to say. More question? Well, I'm assuming, though, you didn't get to see Steve Ditko. Oh. Uh, oh, yes. okay. No no. Oh, no, I got comments. <laughs> 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 uh, still knocking on the doors. Still getting a indifference. That's not a no, though. Yeah. He's um, he's actually working with more Todd and, and Paul Coverberg on these new. Oh. They're reprinting a lot of this, some of his unpublished. Right. Things. Yeah. So Mort had the idea that since he has an affinity for Paul Lindon to send Jackie to the next <laughs> oh, batch of comics. <laughs> I don't mind being the bait. <laughs> and so off she goes, and uh, it sort of worked. He was interested. And he yeah, I. I went to his door to deliver the comics, and the great part about where Steve lives is that he, he doesn't have a large mail slot in his door. It's like envelope size, that's about it. He also doesn't have a peephole, so he has to answer the door. <laughs> and since I can't cram his comics through, I knock on the door, he answered, I delivered the comics, I told him what I was there for and what I needed, and essentially it was, I'm doing research, I need help, I wasn't there, and no one records it. And when I told him it was just about Charles, not about Marvel, uh, he he brightened up so much, and I was so excited that he was excited. And he said, "Write me a letter," and I did. And I think I overdid it. Well, you did follow the Ditko rules. You can write him a letter. You have to write a handwriting in pencil, and he will reply. Yeah. So I I did that. I think I overstepped my boundaries because. How do you tell a person all about this project in, in one piece of paper? And I couldn't do it. So I got a very stern letter back, um, including uh, why bother, you know, if you can't remember something, why you, uh, how did it something go? About, I, I want to move forward and not look back. Like so not look back, and why, why bother remembering something that happened all these years ago? Right, yeah, and when he yeah. wrote the word years, obviously pissed him off because the word years was carved in graphite where I opened up the letter in the graphite. <laughs> <laughs> Won't do that again. But I keep going back and he doesn't slam the door on my yeah. face. Do you have a hidden camera? You can go in and like, you know. Oh, no, we don't want to no. like, you know, be no. trust her. I know. Um, no, I, I haven't done that because he doesn't want to be on camera. I don't want to overstep my boundaries. Right. And, but just and, audio, as you've done with other things. I, I just do not. Well, we do. Uh, we have, and both Joes have done it, we've asked them to address him on camera and ask him to be part of the movie. Um, mm -hmm. So part of the plan is to somehow get this movie into him and hopefully he has some kind of device to play this yeah. movie. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's already been 10 years since Jonathan Ross and Neil Gaiman were up there for the documentary on the BBC. Yeah. So he's not getting any younger. Yeah, he did. He Believe saw me. them and he talked to them, but they had to be off camera. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I mean, if he wants to be silhouetted. We have all the technology. We got John Byrne. Uh, we'll see. But he hasn't said no. So, no, so until I get a restraining order or no. <laughs> <laughs> he's got, like I always say, he's got three options. 
You can say yes, which is the easy way. Just don't close the deal because our budget's the goal. Don't. don't. <laughs> you can go file a restraining order or he's going to leave us too soon and then you know we're all out of luck. But I'm doing my best. It's for you guys. <laughs> he's a big part of Charlotte. He's a huge part of Charlotte. Uh, yeah. So we, yeah. we are going to cover him. They're probably going to kick us off in about three or four minutes, so if we have any more questions any more for questions? Our, our illustrious guests. Do you guys want to have one closing statement? We're about to close down. Oh, I I'll take this up after I go out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd I just like to say, you know, I, I loved it working in Charlton. I'm glad I was there, and I still have friends I made back then, and I'm proud of some of the work I did there. So uh, I'm glad I went through there. Out of some of the work? Proud of some of the work. Okay. <laughs> and I, I just would like to say that, you know, uh, and I said this to Jackie, we, were, we interviewed Roy Thomas back in August at Terrificon, and we were pushing our big cart for you here out to the thing, and Neil Adams saw us, and he said, waved us over, and we talked to him for about a half an hour about life, politics, all kinds of stuff, nothing to do with comics, and he got pulled away because he was, you know, ignoring his duties. And um, we walked away and I said, what kind of life is this? We've accomplished nothing in comics and these yeah. guys are our friends. And, you know, and, and I got an email from Joe Staten a couple weeks ago and he said, I heard you're doing a panel in Rhode Island. I'm going to be there. Can I join you? And I said, <laughs> that's awesome. You know, like, that's just awesome when you see those names in your inbox. And, uh, you know, that's really what cool. kind of life is this? And we appreciate you guys yeah. so much, so much. Yeah, couldn't do it without the interest. Yeah. So it's real grassroots, and we're trying to punch through that pop culture bubble and get a larger audience exposed to this. You know, all these cosplayers out there don't know. Uh, you know how many Rorschachs we run into that don't know yeah. where the inspiration came from. Aren't and, many of us list, Jackie. I know, Joe, I'm trying, I'm trying to go as fast as I can. <laughs> so, uh, we're working on, on um, a pretty big announcement, and we're hoping that with this announcement that we're going to make soon, that mm -hmm. um, a solution to a rapid conclusion is with yeah. it. But, um, I mean, on the plus side, the longer it takes to make this project, the more we learn, the more we, learn, the more we can include it. Um, until we feel it's done, we'll keep going. I don't think it'll ever be done, done. Because um, something new will always pop up. I know. The, the goal is to great. make a 90 minute or hour 40 minute really entertaining, quick moving, mm -hmm. fun, like the first trailer. Lots like, of that fun. kind of tempo. Um, you know, and we even want to do like, take some of the ads from the comics and like do these like, fake commercials to break it up and, and have some reenactments and things like that. So, you know, so it's not just talking heads. Yeah. And, Not and that these talking heads aren't great to look at. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, like we said, we'll supplement it any way we can. We've got like five hours of extras on the Blu-ray or oh put stuff on the internet. But, you know, we're not going <laughs> to just give you a 90-minute movie and call it a day. No. So you're going to have like interviews, like sections of... We will have everything that needs to be shown. We'll probably just take the entire raw footage. Here's yeah. the whole Roy Thomas. Here's the whole Joe Because here's the thing. Just no one bothered to document Charlton before. And since we're putting in all the effort, it's never going to get lost again. Uh, it's really a, probably a 20-hour Ken Burns kind of thing to yeah. do it right. But, right. Yeah. but I don't think we have an <laughs> audience for 20 hours. No. So it's going to be a choose your own adventure on the bonus features. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. 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 Yeah. So. So it's uh we we officially closed our Island Comic Con. Our Island Comic Con is officially closed. Oh. You guys want we have posters <laughs> up here and um, postcards. postcards. Not find us. And I saw the clipboard already went around. So. Right on. We will get you a link to some stuff to watch. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Oh, I'm sick. Oh, I'm sick. Oh, I'm sick.